Live from World Play Inc. Studios in sunny California, your host, Hillary Scar. Hey everyone, I'm riding Didi, my dragon, followed closely by my co-host David Maldo and the Flying Saucer. We are so excited to have you here. So come on and let's hang. But first, give a roaring welcome to my co-host. David Maldo, David. <laughs> oh, we did it, our new opening. <laughs> yes, it's a success. <laughs> it's a success. <laughs> you guys, welcome. We're here on a Tuesday this week. We're changing things up this summer. So uh, it feels different, doesn't it? It feels like a Wednesday, but it's Tuesday. But uh, we have been doing this show, Hanging with Hillary, since January, right? I think we're on episode 19. I think that's right. We're on episode 19, where I get to hang with my awesome friends, talking about film and art and the journey of being an artist and all the crazy, wacky things that we do along the way. So uh, uh, for, be first, 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 I always forget to remind people that we are building our subscriber base, so please hit that subscribe and ring the bell so uh, to notify when we go live, uh, because we have got some treats in store for you. Tonight, my longtime friend, my collaborative partner who has uh, worked with me on dozens of projects, let's give a warm round of applause to cinematographer extraordinaire, Mr. Jeff Gatesman. Jeff! I like that we got the cheer. <laughs> Jeff, how are you doing? It's good to see you virtually. I'm good. Yeah, it's good to see you as well. It's been a while. Have, I know we haven't seen each other all year, although we have done a project together, but um, right. It was our first project. We were not actually in the same room or even in the same city, which we're going to get to in a bit. But uh, before we go and have a chit chat with Jeff, uh, I'm going to read a little bit of his bio. Actually, this is going to be an interactive bio. I'm trying something new this week. So you started your very first credit, I believe, was the Oprah Winfrey show. Is that correct? Well, I mean, I don't know that I actually ever got a credit on that. Um, you know, I was working for a company. We did all the uh, out of studio stuff, you know, all the remotes and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, I did that for about two or three years. And um, I, I don't know that I actually ever got a, you know, credit on the show for it. Why? I mean, you worked on the show. You were part of the crew. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, we were not an everyday um, thing, but it was two to three days a week at least. Which that's was, working that's working for oprah so you can say you and oprah are like this and you know i know that yeah. <laughs> she probably it's wouldn't want anyone else to shoot her for video. you uh all right so oprah because from chicago we're both from chicago did not know each other in chicago right but what part of chicago are you from again uh, i grew up in the suburbs uh just just west of uh west of the city and then uh you know, I moved downtown to go to college, to go to Columbia College. That's right, for film. Stayed there for a while. Before you moved picked up some snazzy technical tricks and tips that yeah. always impressed me. Um, and then you went on to work as a cinematographer and cameraman for studio films, commercials, independent films, and odd jobs, which we're going to also talk about. I love talking about people's odd jobs and side hustles. Like one, one of your side hustles now you do is actually still working in film production. Like you work on some massively huge shows. Yeah, I have, yeah. Doing, um, I know you do electric, I know you do dimmer right. board. I, when I first got here, you know, I started working primarily as a gaffer, uh, in, which got me into the whole studio system, which was great. And, uh, you know, I got to work on some really big projects and, and it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a great opportunity, and I got to learn a, a ton of things about, you know, the whole craft. And uh, yeah, it was it was really cool. Now, for people who don't know what a gaffer is, can you explain in layman's terms what a gaffer uh, is? 
technically the gaffer is is basically the head of the lighting department so you know like uh i'll work uh, alongside the, the director of photography uh to basically uh light the scene to allow his vision to come through on on film or you know on, or hers or, or hers. hers exactly yeah I've, done, I've worked with quite a few uh female directors uh, one of course is hillary scarl you know but uh have you also, have you gaffed for any female cinematographers yeah um I've, I've gaffed for um gosh i can't remember her name now but she's uh um quite famous and i can't remember her name now okay i put you on the spot <laughs> yeah, that was a long time ago uh yeah, so you, it's, I think they said something like 3% of all cinematographers are women. So 3%? I think it's 3% is so low. It's so yeah, low. That's, that's a shame, really. I know. So we're bringing on um, more women and hopefully, especially just giving, giving them a shot, giving, giving them an opportunity to shadow. Or I know that you and I often have people shadow us and we've had deaf interns in the past who've been able to watch you work which has been great but we need to bring more women in yeah definitely yeah um, I, right. though, too i mean you know i see a lot more women uh you know directors of photography um you know uh, uh, that one woman just won the uh oscar a couple of years ago for uh the rachel morrison Exactly. Yeah. Who I actually interviewed right before she, yeah, right before she hit the big time. Really? Yeah. I was a board member of the Alliance of Women Directors, and we did an event where she had a fantastic film, but it was a small indie film, and we screened it, and we had a pretty good size audience, but people didn't know who she was. And then after the film, I, um, moderated a Q&A with her and the audience. And it was so interesting because I'm thinking like, oh, if we had done this after <laughs> she had gotten all famous, yeah. then she it's interesting. Of, she was a little famous before uh, Black Panther. She had done that movie Mudbound uh, prior to that, which was got a ton of acclaim as well. It was really beautiful. Right. Yeah. Oh, she just does stunning work. And she did it pregnant. She showed pictures right. of her working while she was pregnant, which is so badass. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, all right. So the other project Jeff has done is Tears of a Full Moon, which was one of your first documentaries, right? Right. Well, that wasn't one of my first, but it was it was the biggest one that I had done uh, because, you know, it meant uh, uh, traveling to the Amazon in Brazil and, uh, you know, spending a lot of time there to, to, to um, you know, to get all the material we needed to make the movie. And, and it was about the movie is about uh, the music and folklore of the of the area, which is, you know, it's the only Indo-Brazilian music in that that comes out of that country. Every all the other music like samba and rumba, and everything is all Afro-Brazilian, you know. So it's got its influences, you know, in another continent altogether. Um, so it was great, and we we were we had planned uh, the trip to to coincide with a three-day festival that they have in one of the small villages on, along the Amazon River. And it's, it's all about, uh, you know, celebration of music. And it's just, I mean, it's, it's a crazy performance art, music, folklore festival for three days that just uh, is insane. <laughs> That's all I can say about Well, that was the first awesome. film I think you showed me that I was like, all right, I have to work with you. Cause I knew what you had to do to get some of those shots. It's such a good film, you guys. Tears of a Full Moon. Go see it. Um, where can they find it, Jeff? Is it out? Uh, right now, I think you can only get it on Amazon. Uh, the unfortunate thing about it is it was shot in standard definition, so it's not uh, it's not widely available because it's not an high def. You know. I know you and I started in SD, and then it's it's mm -hmm. tough because some of our older projects, but we're not here to talk about sad things. We're here to hear talk about happy things, and one thing. David and I like to do is making our guests feel happy by going to your happy place. So if you were to pick one place on earth, that's your happy place, Jeff Gatesman, where will you take us? Well, the one place that I have spent a lot of time in that I always want to go back to is, is Prague in the Czech Republic. 
Prague. David, can you work some magic and take us to Prague? <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's perfect. It's so good. It's so beautiful. I want to go to Prague now. And that clock oh, is so cool. cool. Yeah, I love this. That's, I, I think I told you before, this is the astronomical clock that's in one of the squares there. It's, uh, it's this crazy, you know, engineering feat that, uh, you know, instead of just like one cuckoo come out of the clock every 15 minutes, it's this whole parade of, of little, you know, animated people that come out of that thing. It's, it's really amazing. Now, did you do a film in Prague or were you just there on vacation? I was in Prague to study black and white photography. Oh, really? A little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, that was sort of, uh, it was more of a, like a, a, an excuse for me to uh, ship my motorcycle to Europe. I spent <laughs> a couple of months riding around Europe on my motorcycle and ultimately ending up in Prague to, to take some photography classes. Were you inspired by some of these like famous motorcycle trips? Because I know like uh, I'm blanking on the name of the most famous so one. Easy Rider or uh, some of the some of the ones that uh, that that actor takes like the long way around, the long way right. around those sort of things. Well, those did those weren't um, my trip came before those other than Easy Rider, obviously. But you know there was just something about wanting to you know I'd heard I've spoken to people about. Uh, riding in Europe and, and how much fun it is and you know how it's like a totally different culture and it is there's parts of Europe uh, have a much greater like motorcycle culture than any anywhere here in the states that I've come across and it's oh, just sounds fun, fun. yeah and I think I remember and I think I remember some pictures that you showed I certainly love your black and white photography I know that that oh, thank you. thanks that that's something that you are you definitely have a knack for so uh so i went back and we were trying to figure out during our tech run how many projects we had and we kept forgetting about different ones and i think we came up with 15 different projects we've done two features uh we did uh jeff was my cinematographer for see what i'm saying and for no ordinary hero uh which I produced and Jeff was a DP. Then uh, the very first project we ever together did together was a world play documentary promo. Sadly, the documentary never fully got off the ground, but it kept repeating itself and may eventually get off the ground. <laughs> it keeps reliving in many incarnations. It's just one of the ideas I just can't let go of but that's yeah that's what started the whole thing and Sharon Stone is a cameo in the promo and it was getting kids from or teens from around the world and war-torn countries to come together to do a collaborative theater production to then take to the Edinburgh Festival so that was the grand plan and we we got close we had funders come and oh it was it was cool, but it cemented our friendship and our work relationship because we worked really well together getting that promo and we both just want to work. So then we did a reality show sizzle with a deaf family. We did the Spartacus spoof that if you go to the Hillary Scarl uh, website, you get to, yeah, it's the 45 second. Um, I'm Hillary Scarl. I'm Hillary Scarl. No, I'm Hillary Scarl. I'm Hillary Scarl. <laughs> I'm Hillary Scarl. <laughs> We're all Hillary Scarl. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs> my favorite short that we did was Ditto. Did you know that? Did I ever tell you that? I've seen Ditto. That was it's your good. Favorite? Uh, that was done. We shot that in one day. That was part of the On the Lot Challenge. Yeah, yeah. That we had to do. I had. Uh, we. I was given a log line and given five days to write, direct, produce, edit and deliver an original short that was five minutes or less. And that's what got me on the show. So- uh, well, it, was it is really, good. It was, it was really funny, it was well done. Everybody involved in it was, was fully committed too. You know, everybody had their, you know, they, they were very into it. Oh, well. 
Totally. And I and you were so into it. You came up with so many creative rigs on the spot because we had one day to prep it, which is crazy, but that's what they were looking for for directors who could work super fast on the show. So I remember you rigging a slider on set. So we had an actor that was sliding all the length of a conference room table. It's about a, it was about a cup that nobody know they're trying to find it in an office and it's the ditto cup and no one knows what that means until the very end. We kind of like rosebud, we reveal what the ditto cup is. But we had, then finally it shows up and it falls, it flies through the air. And we've got an actor making a dive along the conference room table. And you came up with a slider like on I don't this even know if you know. slider days. I mean, back when, now everybody has a slider. You know, this was, I think this was but before you some, like, people were- You using. put something together though. I remember that. I remember you thinking like we were trying to figure it out because we had no, we had very little prep time, no real rehearsal time. I mean, I was rehearsing the actors and blocking while you were getting set up. It was, it was, it was so tight, but that was what they made the challenge to be that- right. We had a very small window to shoot this. And then I love the fact that uh, instead of having the cup fly through the air, just filming it, that we made a dummy cup. And at your house, we put the dummy cup on a drill head where it spun around in a circle and you film that and then you rotoscoped it into the picture. So it looks like a flying cross. It was, fun. It was clever. It was super clever. And that's when I was like, okay, you can do some really cool stuff. And, then you were doing animation stuff for my titles. I was like, okay, that's another trick you've got up your sleeves. <laughs> so like, was... A well-rounded education at Columbia College. They taught us a lot of things. But I like your ingenuity where that's one thing I've always really appreciated about you is that you will see things and opportunities where I trust you so implicitly, you know, so completely when we get to a set that I know you're going to be taking care of um, all the visuals and I can really focus on the actors and the talent and the performances, which is what I love to do. And uh, we always discuss and have our lookbooks in advance and the general feel and our, all our ideas. But on the day, I know that you're looking for all these visual opportunities Well, I'm really focused and honed in with my actors and it works. It just totally yeah. works. That's, you know, one of the things that I, that I really love about working with you is that you, you are fully committed to the, to the prep work as well, you know, like, oh, God, putting, yeah. you, know, you know, putting together lookbooks and uh, coming up with colors and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, it's really funny because, you know, obviously you, you've heard the, the joke in our, in our community that, you know, we'll fix it in post. And as I just read this today, somebody said, well, you know, the most expensive thing you could do is fix it in prep. You know, or not, it's not the most expensive thing because it's just you basically sitting behind a desk dreaming this stuff up. But you're making it, you know, you're figuring out how to do it. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out how to do it when it's cheaper to fix it in prep. Yeah. That's what I would to, think. Yeah. I think it's more expensive to fix it in post. post. You don't want to be. Yeah. yeah. I, I think they had the, the analogy backwards. In, uh, but I think prep so. makes so much more sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we need to talk to them. But I'm looking at our list here of all the things we've done. And most, I have to say, at least half of our projects, we have shot in a day. I know that uh, we shot Ditto in one day. We shot, um, I believe, uh, The Deaf Family in one day. I'm Hillary Scarl. We shot like in the morning. Yeah. In yeah. four hours, but I storyboarded the hell out of that where I wanted it to be a shot for shot remake of the Spartacus. So I actually rented Spartacus and froze it at every camera change. And then I do my chicken scratch um, storyboards, which Jeff now kindly knows how to interpret. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, is that Sky? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's like to shoot up, you know, from down below into the sky. <laughs> see it's a cloud you're like oh i thought it was a tree no it's a it's it's the cloud the sky and so then we shot that in a day we shot the music video for see what i'm saying in a day was that a, just one day I thought one day we needed two days and i believe we got it in one and it was a muddy day it had rained torrentially right, right. 
So, and I just found out right before we went live that the See What I'm Saying music video actually is up three times on my channel. So we've got two HD versions and one SD version. So, so no excuse for people not to see it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so we need 70,000 people to rewatch. Oh. The, um, what happened? Did we hiccup? Yeah, yeah just the camera hiccup, but it's back. We're back. Okay. I looked down at my notes and I saw a blink. Uh, let's see, the PSA we shot in a day and the singletons in a day. So we're going to talk about the singletons in a moment. Actually, let's talk about um, the singletons now before we show the okay. PSA. Okay. So during the pandemic, I, I, you know, like everybody else was trying to think like, what is happening? This was at the very beginning, like in March mm -hmm. and everything was shutting down. Right. And productions were shutting down. And my friend, my hero, Emily Best tweeted, I wonder what the dog me 20 is going to be based on the dog me, what is it, 95, where uh, Lars Von Trier and a bunch of filmmakers set some limitations and parameters for what they would shoot only. So their rules for shooting uh, a whole bunch of films, like in a period of one year, was only natural light, no artificial light, only found objects and the actor's real clothing they couldn't bring in wardrobe. So they set those challenges for themselves and made a bunch of beautiful films. So I tweeted back, I think the Dog Me 20 is going to be, um, everything is gonna be shot in clean singles because everybody's gonna be in a different location. And then I thought, I wonder if I could write a short script that looks like a cohesive film and all the actors are in their own homes. And then of course I called Jeff and said, Jeff, do you wanna do this? He said, yes. And so we wrote a couple, I wrote a script and then Jeff had some great notes and we, we really wanted to try to elevate it, which I appreciate you challenging me to say like, no, let's really make like a film, not just a bunch of cuts between, you know, actors in different places and make it cohesive. So uh, I grabbed a bunch of friends including a bunch of our former guests, Mark Beltzman, who was on the show, uh, right. Michael Murray, who was our first guest, was on the show, and Hillary Bareford's going to uh, come. And then we had Ben McFadden. Um, and we did the Singletons. Yeah. And so go ahead, Jeff. The, the, the interesting thing about it was we were under so many limitations, not, you know, uh, being, you know, in a lockdown situation during the pandemic and stuff. And when you brought this up to me, oddly, at the same time, I had just uh, finished a project for one of my clients where, you know, we were doing interviews by going and interviewing people and the pandemic came along and they said, we want to continue doing this, but we obviously have to do it remotely. Um, and so we came up, uh, we discovered this uh, software that allowed us to use uh, other people's cell phones as the cameras and right you know the the you know i could control uh the, the cameras uh technically you know the input uh audio and video input and that sort of thing and all we had to do was convince them to put the cameras or the phones in the proper spot and then act in front of it more or less Right. So we had one rehearsal with the five actors for performance because they weren't going to see each other. So that way they could get their timing down. And then we had one technical rehearsal over. I'm sorry. What was the platform again, Jeff? That we used? Uh, you know, I'm on the spot again. I can't remember now. I know it was some. I want to say OBS, but that's David's platform. Yeah, right. I want to say JVC, but that's my camera. <laughs> it's got, it's um, like OB or something. Anyways, uh, so we did one technical rehearsal uh, for eyelines where we had all the actors set their iPhones up and we had screenshots from the other actors. So they looked like they, the eyelines would match and that they were right for each other. And then had, they had to adjust their own lights and mics and, uh, one actor like late in the day it was like the perfect lighting and we're like okay we're gonna film you at five o'clock because that's when the light comes in this window and obviously we don't have a crew right. so we had to use available lighting and then we shot each actor individually and like jeff said all the footage went straight from their iphone straight to jeff's hard drive 
and in his home. And then he was able to edit together. And DeAndre Allen Toole, who was also a guest of ours, scored it, did a fantastic job. Uh, got a colorist as a favor to color. And a, um, my friend Marcus did the poster design. And voila, we had a short film that cost zero dollars and actually right. made it into the Burbank International Film Festival, which was pretty awesome. Um, and the, the hard part for us, I mean, the challenge for us, like I think we, we I don't know if people understood it, that what we were trying to do was uh, connect these actors as though they're in the same space. Exactly, and people cannot believe they are all in different places. Yeah, including as far away as Hawaii, where Mark Felton was in Hawaii. Who's in Hawaii, who was knocking on the door and Michael who's um, in um, Echo Park is yelling back at him and they're having conversation back and forth. Yeah, completely across the ocean. So that was- right. That was, so that was the challenge and you know i think i think it turned out great i think it turned out great too i'm very Me happy too. about that hey but um we're, let's show a little bit of our psa i'm going to set it up first uh this is actually a job that um we were hired to do through the greater los angeles agency on deafness was a psa about preventing hiv among deaf women so jeff and i had a chat about what we wanted to do it was only 45 seconds was all we were given. Um, I, very, very little money, just enough to be able to, I think we, we even used, we didn't pay for our location. I think we just found a park somewhere and quickly, everything was outside. So we just yeah. set up. I think we stole all our locations, right? Pretty much. I mean, we were on uh, somebody's outdoor um, patio like a coffee shop or something. I think we got that before they opened, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Which kids never do it, but Jeff and I um we're, <laughs> we're both pretty stealth and we've both we've had our hands slapped a bunch of times for stealing shots. <laughs> uh yeah, didn't were you were there with me? I was in New York and I got kicked out of the subway for filming. No, is that when you were with filming Robert? I was feeling, yeah, that was, I think we had a, um, a second crew that was there. I had a New York camera guy. Yeah, we got, we got kicked off by the New York City Metro. They're like, nope. And then it's just feigning like, really? Oh, it's home video. I mean, cause there's no, there's no tripod. There's no lights. There's no wires. It's just yeah. one handheld camera, but. They're like skater punks. I thought, I thought we were allowed to do this here. Yeah. <laughs> It's not good. And then later, if you ever want to sell something, they're going to ask for clearances. And if you don't have it cleared, you can get in trouble. But yeah. we're we're beyond that, Jeff. I think I think we've we've moved beyond our our stealing shot days. I hope so. I hope so too, because that's not fun. But we have had the most these incredible actors. I was really lucky that I knew half of these actors who are in the PSA, and the other half auditioned for out like half of them now are working. The very first actress you see, um, Natasha Ophelia, is how, I believe how you say her name, has been working doing like a ton of TV shows. Really? She's been doing, yeah, she's been doing a ton of stuff. I was like, wait, that's the girl that's in my PSA. And at the very end, uh, Ashley Fiolik, who is a deaf motocross champion. And we actually used her in No Ordinary Hero because she was so much fun. Yeah, to work yeah. with so we actually actually got to ride an ordinary hero but in the psa she's at the very end just with her bike in the Riding car in motorcycle in outer space what's that you have to ride her motorcycle in outer space in that movie. yeah an ordinary hero yeah jeff animated the whole sequence where she went on a fantasy nice. um dirt bike ride but um yeah let's show this short psa uh we did it's called because and it's 45 seconds so We'll be right back. Take us to the screening room, David. I didn't use a condom. My husband had an affair, and I'm worried. I've had an STD, so I'm more vulnerable. It's fast and confidential. I want to be healthy and live longer. These are our reasons for getting an HIV test. What are yours? I like 
like that. And we won an award for it too, right? Nice. Yeah, yeah. We did get Aurora Award, I think. Aurora Award. So I like the fact that we got to hire all deaf actors. All the actors were deaf. We got to hire an ASL consultant. Um, I think Lisa there, uh, she was on set and she did all the ASL translations as our ASL master and then also had deaf eyes on it in the editing room just you know for final approval. So that's something that is really important to both of us to have that happening. Right. So yeah, and that was that was a while ago we did it, right? It I think yeah. yeah. Neither of us either remember nor want to say the year, but it was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't it around the same time we did the super deaf movie? The no ordinary hero? Yeah. I, it was before Noir, but yeah, everything is, it becomes a blur after a while. I think that was, I'm going to guess somewhere around 2014, if yeah. I had to guess, maybe, Yeah. but I might be wrong. And yeah. then I'm looking over our other part. Oh yeah. And then Jeff and I also did Rochambeau, a short documentary for current TV together where they came up with the idea, I believe, that they said there's this crazy rock, paper, scissors competition that's taking place in Orange County. Can you go and make a short documentary about it? And Jeff and I were like, sure we can. <laughs> so we went down there and it was so crazy because everybody was all dressed up like a cage match. They had their characters like wrestlers and they That's took hilarious. it very seriously and it's all like rock paper scissors you know and they had umpires and it was like this what was it jeff it was like a, a studio or a nightclub it was this it was bizarre a nightclub, yeah, because they were they would get up on stage at one point too I mean, there was stuff going down like on the floor and then uh, the bigger stuff was going on on, on the stage and but it was like a weird space. It wasn't like a theater. It was like a nightclub with a stage where like bands would play or yeah, something. It was not in Orange County, wasn't it at Echo Park? Up right on Sunset? Sure. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> it was one of those back back room bars where they normally would have bands. Or some kind of fight club would take place or something. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly the feeling I got. Because there was an outdoor alley too, and everybody was there was a lot of people hanging out. We've in the alley. had some great interviews in the out in the alley. Mm -hmm. yeah. Looking back, felt so sketchy because we didn't know who they were. They didn't know who we were. It was, it was. I couldn't tell how seriously they really took it. Like I thought it was hilarious that they're all dressed up like that. But yeah, it, some of them were like seriously in character, where it was a little bit of cosplay going on. Where I was like, I better not joke because. They're really They're serious. serious about <laughs> they had a lot of them had like were very very serious about you know like their their whole uh, process you know the whole. Um, oh yeah, they would break down their strategy of how they would look and anticipate whether it was going to be rock paper or scissors. Right. <laughs> so crazy. All right, so I'm looking at all these projects. Did you? All right, you said so. You, Ditto was one of your favorites to work on. Yeah. Ah, that's that was good. It was good. Good one. It was fun. Yeah, it was one of those very lucky projects where I felt like nothing went wrong, which I don't think we can say about anything else. Actually, wait. What? Something did go horribly wrong on that. We didn't have a location at first. Isn't that right? There was like I... the morning of we didn't have a location. I remember like I talked to a hotel and I no, I did. I rented I rented a room and said, can we use your conference room? They said if you I can't remember if, if I had to pay for a room in order to use the conference room. I said, we have a very important meeting. It's only gonna be four. <laughs> and they said well, you can only have it for four hours or there was it was like a very limited time. And we did not say we're doing this to shoot a film. And so we gave each of the actors a bag to carry in, like it was part of a conference. <laughs> <laughs> so we were very stealth and very quiet. And yeah, like like it was just a very small setup. I, I don't even know if we had any external lights. Do you remember? Um, I don't think so. No, it was just ugly conference room lights. And then yeah. we just. That was the one time we had to fix the it in post. 
But right. you know, the lighting actually didn't look bad. I think they had those beautiful like inset lighting that it was it wasn't it wasn't bad. Yeah. Well, sometimes Stop. in a situation like that, you just have to put people in the right place. Yeah, another location stolen yet again. Yeah, we gotta get over this. But you know, we we actually we did pay for no locations for no ordinary hero. Oh yeah, of course. We had to do that, and then, yeah, every, that was the only one. Oh, and and um, the music video we we went through because obviously yeah. that was some mansion backyard that, that we, was an amazing location, a beautiful house. It was a gorgeous house and a massive backyard because we had aerialists that had to rig their rigging right. yeah. up in the trees, and we had a fire blower, so we had to get a permit for that. Guy on so, stilts stilt walkers jugglers and then you did all the green screen too inside the house right which um that was the first time i saw you do the green screen well jeff you know what i need to do um at the end of every shoot at least i try to at very least is to buy you a drink and so the fact that you said your very favorite bar in prague is the james joyce bar so on me jeff Steve Excellent. and I would like to take you to the James Joyce bar. Let's go. Let's, Let's go. It. There it is. Boy, it looks the same. <laughs> <laughs> now, I love the fact that you were actually here in this location before. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah, like. I think I took a bunch of pictures. I used to park my motorcycle right out in front, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, I'd take pictures of people on the motorcycle or standing there looking at it or whatever. And yeah, it was fun. Now, I love the fact that, you know, you've been a car guy since I've known you and I've known you since, yes, and <laughs> since we've known each other, well, probably before then, I'm going to guess that you've been a car buff your whole life, that you photograph cars, you race cars, you, um, you watch cars, you drive cars. Where yeah. did this come from? Where did your love of cars come from? Um. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just, you know, so I've always loved the old cars. When I, as soon as I got my license, I was uh, out looking for cars uh, uh, to buy. I, um, the first car, I think the first car that I bought for myself was a, a 1956 Chevy. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then, and then I bought a 68 Camaro. Uh, that yes. I was, you know, somehow foolishly thinking I could work on both of them at the same time in my father's garage using my father's tools, which didn't go over so well with my father. Oh. So, but, you know, it, it all worked out the way it's supposed to. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of my friends that I was hanging out with at the time were into cars, and, you know. So the Camaro eventually became a stock car for one stock car race. And, yeah. Uh, and I raced that one time. And Where did you race it? That was in a small uh, clay oval uh, track near my house called Santa Fe Speedway. Um, one of my one of my buddies uh, raced there a couple of times. And, uh, two of us decided we would do it together one year, and um, you know it was a it was an interesting, fun time. And the car never rode it; drove again after that. But you know. <laughs> It was fun to do anyways. You know. I know nothing about cars. David, are you in the cars back uh, there in the bar? Very little, but I did have a motorcycle uh, in, the, in the yeah in the 90s. I'll have to show you a picture when I lived in New Orleans. It was did great because it, it, if you, it was, um, it was a Yamaha, but it was like American style, you know, cafe style sitting up. Um, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was great because uh you can't get, take a car into the French Quarter. It takes it takes an hour to go half a mile. I mean, it's you know there's people walking, and you can't park anywhere. You wind up parking a ten minute walk away from the French Quarter, and then walking to the French Quarter with a motorcycle. I pull up to any bar, rock star park in any bar in the French Quarter. It was amazing. <laughs> that's yeah. That's that. primarily when I got it. Uh, got into motorcycles there for a while too. It's a great New Orleans is a great city to have a motorcycle. Yeah, I never went above fifteen miles per hour. Yeah. And I didn't want to. I was happy just putt button around, putt, putt, waving putt. to the tourists. Yeah, yeah. I have never, yeah, I've been on the back of motorcycles. My cousin drives motorcycles, but. 
you know, it was funny having a motorcycle in Prague, so, so, as long as we're in Prague right now. Um, the, the, at, at the time, the, the streets, it, it probably is still the same, but it's like just this weird maze of one-way streets that all seem to kind of try to want to take you to one dead-end area in the middle of nowhere you want to be in, in the city, mm. you know? And uh, um, oh, I remember that uh, the best map of the city of Prague was the McDonald's map. At the time. <laughs> Because it had a way to get to all of the McDonald's. Oh, of course. <laughs> you know, so it was like, the, but for me, it didn't help much because it didn't say this is a one way street. So, uh, McDonald's. After a days of like trying to drive around Prague and getting stuck in the same spot all the time, I just decided eh, I'm, a, I'm an American tourist. I can't read the signs. I don't know which way. What am I not? Uh. So I kind of like made my own rules. For <laughs> That's when I'd become a walking tourist. <laughs> yeah, I could. Now, I'd like to tell everyone, tell David what you uh, did on your birthday this year. You had a big, you had a fun birthday, a pandemic birthday. Yeah, this year was, well, it was supposed to be last year, but, you know, pandemic struck. Um, so this year I, I rented a uh, Porsche on a, on a racetrack for a few hours and Nice. Had somebody, you know, show me how to race the car around the track for a bit. Oh, that sounds fun. Hey, our friend Janice Bremick made it here. Hey, Janice, we're glad you're watching. <laughs> In the pocket, Gatesman. <laughs> Cheers. What in the pocket? <laughs> uh, yeah, Jeff, I actually has joined our volleyball crew and because uh, he lives near the beach. So, um, He's he actually and our team loves Jeff. Yes. Oh well, I love you too. You're great. So, and the one in the pocket. Yes. Yeah. I don't even remember what that means. I think I think you had an extra. Um, there was a one do over. I think everybody that starts gets one do over, like a lifetime do over. Like you soon mulligan. You, you get a mulligan. Mulligan. That's what it was. Right. But you can only use it you get once. Once in your entire life, if you oh, want to. Oh, you got to save it. Goal. Yeah, so it was kind of like it was kind of like a threat at the time. That That's right, where you refused to use your mulligan and you had one in the pocket. I would never use it. <laughs> <laughs> you just hang on to it and through the pandemic and out the other side. You're well, well, David. If you ever make it to California, you are you are coming out to play volleyball with us. I'm ready. Yeah. Fun. It's a great time. So it's Janice horrible. is making fun of the way I said birthday. The fact birthday. that I say birth. I, I guess I say bird. She's saying I say bird day, but I say birthday. <laughs> I'll have to watch the video back and see what I said that she's um, making fun of me in the chat. Yeah. So, birthday. <laughs> yeah. What are friends for, but to tell you what you say wrong? Exactly. That's a good friend that you have spinach in your teeth and you can't pronounce birthday. Yes. <laughs> a vodka gimlet, oh, you got it. Janice, Coming right up. a vodka gimlet from David. <laughs> That's her drink. What's your drink of choice, Jeff? I think I, I know you're a beer guy. We've had I, I like, I like beer. I like margaritas. Um, I like uh, bourbon. That's right. We've had some bourbon. Yeah. We've had bourbon to celebrate. We've had uh, we've had bourbon to cry into on the right. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah the projects guys. that did not go well. Which you know, after fifteen years and a dozen projects, you're going to have days that don't go well. So, right. yeah, <laughs> for all that. Uh, hey, I think what I want to do next. Although I love this bar set, I think um, we got to use this again. David, yeah, I think we have to do this again. Jeff, you're going to have to come back and come to your James Joyce bar. This will forever be known as Jeff's bar. So uh, we may have other guests in your bar, but it's Jeff's bar. It's have, Jeff's bar. You have time to tell a story about being in a Czech bar? Yeah. Oh, please. Yes. Oh, yeah. Wait. First, Janice was saying that the bottle's green screen. Hold up your bottle of beer again, Jeff. It's a visible Harry Potter bottle. It's true. It's magic. <laughs> It's Gryffindor oh, beer. Magic of green screen. See, Janice, when you come on the screen, you could be green screen too. So, 
mama said there'd be days like this. All right, Jeff, I want to hear your story. All right, so when I was there, it was it was during World Cup, and um, I was uh, I was hanging out with a Brazilian girl for, for the entire time I was there, and the World Cup came down to the final of uh, Brazil versus France, and so we had decided that the cool thing to do would be to go hang out at the French cafe to watch the game, because of course everybody everywhere in Europe, there's a television set to watch the World Cup. Um, so she had gotten there early and was like keeping a, a little space warm for, for us. And by the time I had gotten there, it was completely packed. I mean, it was like solid people from wall to wall. And she was like sitting in this like, like windowsill, like that, like right over my right shoulder in the James Joyce there, right? Something like I mean that. that? Yeah, back there. Uh, <laughs> so the only way for me to get there was to kind of shimmy along the wall, you know, with all these people pressed up against me. And it's right at the moment of like kickoff. They're just about to start the game. And like everything in Prague, it's kind of all barely held together a little bit, you know. And at this point, I'm shimmying along the wall and my leg hits something sticking out of the wall, some little thing. And as soon as my leg hits it, I hear this like sound, like a, an electrical shock sound, and all the power in the place goes off. What? Like, right at the moment of kickoff. Oh no! no. The face in the bar turned and looked right at me. <laughs> <laughs> you destroyed the World Cup. I destroyed the World Cup for everybody. And one of the guys looks at me and says, "You'd better get out of here." <laughs> Oh my God! Uh, that was my uh, exciting World Cup experience in Prague. Damn, that's yeah. crazy. The only other World Cup uh, tie-in we had um, Joe Milner, who you know, our sound designer, who's yeah. done all our sound for our projects. He actually performed. Wasn't it the World Cup, David, where he did his crazy long hair band? I think so. Yeah, where he pulled out this footage from the 80s of Joe, like this with the crazy long hair and performing. I think it was at the World Cup. And I was like, it might I have been football. Watched. I think it was soccer. You Not know sure. me. I don't know cars or sports. You can talk about mom and shunts and theater. I can talk about that. But don't ask me car or sports questions. That's it was funny. something big with people in a stadium where they were throwing uh a ball around it was sports like, it was a sports ball game it was, it was a sports ball game <laughs> sports ball sports ball i like that it's yeah. soccer football but i don't know sports ball. sports ball hey jeff before we go to our next set i want you to um set set us up and tell us a little bit about your drones because you became an f the uh of f FAA certified? Is that the certification? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's a it's a certification that allows you to legally, you know, fly drone, drones commercially. You can fly a drone for fun all you want, but if you're going to do it commercially, you have to have you have to have the license. You have to and be, it's FAA. Did I say that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Federal Aviation Administration. Yeah. The airplane people. Yeah, the airplane people. The airplane. Is, <laughs> it's kind of odd because part of the certification is you have to have all this extensive knowledge of airports, which we are not allowed to get anywhere near with a drone. Oh, interesting. That makes sense. It's it's kind of funny. I mean, it, it kind of makes sense, you know, now that I know about it, because there are a few occasions where we actually have to be in contact with the tower of, of a nearby airport, but it's kind of funny. Anyway, so I got, I got into it just because uh, I wanted to explore different avenues, you know, different, you know, ways of, of moving the camera and, and that sort of thing. And I, I really kind of discovered that with aerial photography, you get a completely different perspective than you ever dreamed of. You know, in literally a lot of that you're because you're looking down and out and you're above. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and you see things differently when you're when you're up there. I mean, you just sort of don't even recognize that uh, that you can have uh, 
the landscape look different than from above than it does when you're on the ground looking for a shot and that sort of thing. Well, hey, David, uh -huh. let's, while we're talking about this, let's go ahead and show off some of Jeff Gatesman drone cinematography. Oh. Oops, Jeff. Oh. There we go. There. Oh, you're back. Oh, it's doing that. Huh. I don't know. But this uh, is all your footage that you shot with your drone. Right. Yeah, you're right. It's, it is a, it is a different perspective from up here. It looks totally different. Right? <laughs> from your little pup You're pup. right. <laughs> now, did you plan for that horse to be there? Is that part of the Yeah, shoot? that was that was part of a, a, a shoot that I did in Wisconsin. Nice. Yeah, and this is the Red Rocks in uh, outside of Denver, Colorado. I think tying in Michael Murray again from episode one. Oh. Performed a uh, song. Who's also in the Singleton. See how everything all just ties together. Yeah, yeah. Yours, yours is a very small universe. It's a small universe. I'm going right in the bridge. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. This is so cool. Do you ever like fly upon somebody doing something that you weren't expecting, but you didn't, couldn't see until you were up in the air? Uh, you know, it's oddly, yes. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of times that um, you, you, I can't really see a lot of the details. I did a, um, a few weeks ago, I did a, a shot for a documentary on the uh, uh, LA uh, underground subways that used to be here in the 50s and 60s. And um, we, you know, we did this really great shot. And then after we're looking at it, um, you know, we saw that there's like a man with his dog in the shot that we didn't, I couldn't see because of the high contrast of the screen at the time. So, uh, so we had to do it again, but you know, it was all right. Whoops. Yeah. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. I was flying uh, along a, a river in Colorado once, and uh, I think somebody started shooting their shotgun at the drone, which people are mad know. at drones. Yeah. If they feel like it's an invasion of privacy, like they don't know who it is or who's flying. Yeah. No, I know, I know. You know, it's crazy. Maybe they're, maybe they're doing something illegal too. Who knows? Now yeah. they're becoming part of storylines. I feel like I've watched two movies this week that had drones as part of the plot where the drone caught stuff that wasn't supposed to be caught. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Oh, I have a drone story. Can I tell a drone story? Yes. It, this is it's true story. From, well, I read it on the internet, but I, I read it on an actual news site, I think. It was a while ago. So yeah. in Japan, they were starting to use the drones. Uh, the Japanese mafia were using the drones to deliver drugs back and forth because, I mean, right? Well, it's a good way to do it. So they're delivering drugs back and forth using the drones. The Japanese police figured this out. So they got bigger drones with nets and were using them to try to knock down the <laughs> drug drones. The Japanese mafia responded by getting even bigger drones with some sort of grabber or something to knock down the police drones. And on the one hand, this is very, That's very serious true. business because it's illegal drugs. It's millions of dollars, very serious. But on the other hand, the police and the mafia are having the most fun they've ever had in their entire lives. Oh, but that sounds like a game of cat and mouse. Right? Yeah, How cool is that? Jeff, we need to make a movie about that. The drones catching bigger drones, catching drone bigger wars. drones. Yeah, yeah. Do a documentary. Yeah. Drone wars. Japanese drone wars. Right? Oh my gosh. I'm now in. I'm trying to think. I have been watching so many shows right now. They're all getting jumbled in my mind, but there was, yeah, there was something that drone footage caught something and, uh, oh, I know what it was. It was the Les Miserables that was done in 2019. I know I had the same reaction. It was like, wait, what? And it's like this gritty inner city it has nothing to do with the Victor Hugo story, but except for the fact that it was filmed in the same town hmm. as where it took place, but that's where the end of it. I, I'm, I have to look up and see why they named it Les Miserables, but same thing, this kid caught on drone footage of uh, this cop who accidentally fired a flare gun or something into a kid's face Ooh. and was going to brush it off that was an accident, but Drone the side. other kid got it on his drone, and then these cops were after this kid in the footage. It's intense. Yeah. Wow. That's a cool storyline. Yeah, it was pretty intense. It's a, it's a good movie. I think it's on Netflix. There's this, there's this whole new thing going on uh, these days with drones where uh, 
uh, and it's this, this great art form that uh, people are attaching lights to drones and then they'll Wait, do- Wait, what's that boat shot? shot? What's that? What's that boat shot over the bridge? Chicago River. I keep meaning that. When it comes around again, I'll interrupt you again, but. <laughs> um, but the, uh, you know, like they'll, they'll uh, attach a, a light to the, to the drone and they'll fly the drone at night in a pattern and do a long exposure. So then you've got, the drone is doing a couple of things. It's lighting up some of the landscape, but it's also creating these really cool geometric shapes in the sky. Oh, oh. that's cool. Huh. Like underwater Jimmy. ballet, but in the sky with drones. Exactly, yeah, yeah. It's very I cool. I wonder if they could do formations like, what is it, the Blue Angels who do all those crazy formations, but they could probably take more risks because they're not manned by humans. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're not inside, so if they crash, it's- It'll just look cool. Bad, but it's like just equipment and not people. Right. Yeah. Hi, Earl Finn. Is that one of your friends? What's that? Is that your friend? Earl Finn, U R L F I N. Who's Welcome watching to the show. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. <laughs> My brother, Bill. Hey, hey. Is it your twin brother? Not no. your twin, but he's a, that shot, that shot right there with the boats and the train. Yeah, that's the L train going over the Chicago River and what? the boat going under it at the same time. That's, that's so cool. great. That's like such a great shot. I love that. That is yeah. so good. Okay. That is so good. So, all right. So what's next that you are doing or working on or want to work on? What do I want to work on? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. I, that's uh, one of my films that's in, our films that's in development. But other than that, what else? Yeah, I mean, we, get, yeah. we need to get one of those going for sure. Um, uh, you know, I've, got, I've been doing a lot of television stuff this year. I've, uh, done like three television shows and uh, um, I'm going to actually be starting work on another one in about three weeks time and um, other than that I'm just you know kind of you know it's a it's a it's a weird time for everybody these oh, days yeah. you know? and so Can you say what show you're working on or no um, I actually don't know the name of the show that I will be working on uh, but I just I, I just finished a, a a Fox show called uh, Let's Be Real. Um, I was doing the lighting on this stuff. I wasn't uh, camera, but uh, I did, um, pr just prior to that, I did a pilot uh, also for Fox called uh, creatively entitled the, um, the untitled Alex Baldwin, Kelsey Grammer pilot. Huh. So guess who's in it? <laughs> <laughs> Not but, Jamie uh, Foxx, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we did that, and, and uh, I, in the beginning of the year, I was on a, a show called uh, The Sex Lives of College Girls for HBO Max. Sex Lives of College Girls? The sex Lives of College Girls. Because sex sells. Why wasn't that like on HBO at yeah. night? Like, I wonder well, who that's supposed to appeal to. Jeez. It's actually supposed to appeal to young girls, I believe. It's oh. mm, yeah, with well, that kind of title, the it's lesbian written, young girls, perhaps. But it's written and and uh, and developed by um, uh, Mindy Kaling from The Office. Oh, I love I her. I love Mindy. Uh, I mean, it's not. It's she's brilliant. It's not really a comedy, but it's not. Also, it's not like a raunchy, you know. Right. Like, like Is it what, scripted. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Whenever oh. I'm watching The Office and it's a good episode and the writing's really good, I'm like, it's got to be a Mindy episode, and it almost oh, always yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, actually. all the writers in that show are are like the best ever, but she is like, oh, so funny. She's really, really good, and I'm rewatching the Mindy Project, and it's tight. It's just so good, and I love her character so much, and we need more. We need more of that. Yeah, yeah she's we need to get her on the show yeah yeah <laughs> i need we yeah, we need to work with her and then we can be like oh by the way come hang with me yeah. and david and we can do all this well we are almost at our time so uh hey david you want to take us back to our uh talk show set i kind of like it up in this airplane are we gonna keep i know we this can is so much fun i know i know <laughs> 
Right. Uh, That's okay. Thank you so much for coming to hang with me and David. Fun. And we could do a, our trip down memory lane. Uh, yeah. So tell people where would they can find you and follow you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm on gatesman.com. I put in the chat. Yep. Yeah, gatesman.com. And uh, my Instagram is uh, gatesman photo or gates photo. One of the two. One of the two. Yeah, I think it's gatesman photo. There you go. And you can see all of his work and his black and white photography, his drone photography, and uh, personal projects, professional projects. He's got, got a lot of work going up there, which, you know, is one of the things that we talked about on the show is that we've partially because of uh, uh, necessity and others because of who we are, I think branching out to do so many different things. I love the fact that, you know, you've got all these skills as a photographer and they, you do black and white and drones and lighting and uh, camera and cinematography. It's, 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 and then you also love cars. So yeah. yeah. I almost, and motorcycles. And, and motorcycles. Yeah. So it's like, we gotta, yeah, I gotta write something with a car chase to give you a car yeah. chase to film. Well, isn't there a car chase in, uh, in the Christmas movie? The, um, there is there is a car chase in my upcoming script so yes so, there'll be there'll be some fun things to film there you'll definitely be getting your drones out for that <laughs> all for right. sure. Sounds great. we Sounds will fun. be yeah we'll have a fun time with that well yeah. thank you guys for your brother billy uh thank you for watching janice i'm so happy you tuned in and janice gave you a shout out saying yay jeff in the chat so tune in next week where we've got jamie neils finally making it on the show we've had us he's been working overseas so um he's going to be tuning in next tuesday we're on tuesdays for the summer and then we'll be back to wednesdays perhaps in the fall so um subscribe join us but thank you so much for being here and if you like this video share it with your friends and fabulous Kristen, thank you Come on, Dee Dee, let's go and fly out of here. We'll get a drink for real. See y'all next week. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for watching. <laughs>